Welcome to Inaudible. My name is Jeremy Weiland, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ryan Masterson. On this podcast, we discuss the weird, beautiful channeled messages found in the archives of organizations like LL Research, Circle R, and others. The archives contain transcripts of messages from allegedly discarnate sources who articulate a philosophy of spiritual evolution. If you would like an audio version of the transcripts, please subscribe to Ryan's other podcast, Living Love and Light, available on all platforms. Ryan and I will try to provide analysis and commentary on the philosophy described in these messages, identifying the common themes and grappling with the application of this information to our human lives. Thanks so much for joining us on this journey. Good morning, Ryan. How are we doing? Good morning. We're doing fantastic. Great intro, Jeremy. Good job. (laughs) Well read, sir. (laughs) I do what I can when I can. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Yeah. July 2022. We're in July. We are halfway through 2022. I'm pretty sure this whole time thing is like getting all faster or something. (laughs) <laughs> so oh, that's what yeah. it feels like. Oh hell yeah! It yes, is. we out here, and it's it's crazy out here. But uh, four day weekend for yours truly, so I'm not I'm not hurting too bad. Uh, probably gonna get out on the river today. Do some oh, tubing. Nice. I don't even remember what it's like to drink beer on dry land anymore. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> what do you? What have you been up to? What's what's going on in your world? Because we haven't talked in a while. Uh, Side note for the listener, we tried to record last last Saturday, and I just screwed it up completely, and we had to throw the whole thing away. No, so, no, it was a tech. My, my bad. It was not you, sir. It was technical difficulties. It was technical difficulties. So couldn't get. I couldn't get things to work. <laughs> you couldn't get things to work. The technology was against us. So yeah, uh, we're trying again with a little different setup. But yep. this weekend's been interesting uh it's been good you know we have a three-year-old that's exploring emotions without any uh reasoning capacity so for any parents out there who understand we're going through that and for people who don't understand that's okay it's like having a really emotional dog okay but it's uh that so the good times are good the bad times really make you question why you became a parent (laughs) my wife and i were talking about we were talking about I'm just tugging my collar here, guys. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about the cute slash annoying ratio that uh, um, that our kids exhibit. And we've got a baby who's 10 months old and she's cute 99 percent of the time. She got one percent where it's, she's really struggling. She needs some help. Um, our son is like the opposite. <laughs> He's got like 95 or 99. Most of the time, he's just struggling. He's trying to figure out how to navigate things. And then that small slice of the time, he's completely lovable and snuggling. And it makes that 99% worth it. But holy cow, it's uh, it's nonstop at this point. So we're having, um, we're certainly having fun. Uh, joking around about uh, <laughs> about the trials and tribulations, but uh, my wife and my son went to go see some fireworks last night. So my kids' oh, very cool. first time seeing fireworks while I stayed home with the baby, but but he had a great time watching things explode in the sky. So uh, so that was that was cool. Yeah, that sounds yeah. awesome. Yeah, we'll do some barbecuing today. It's gonna get pretty rainy, so. Not the typical. What is what is typically a hot Fourth of July weekend up here in the Pacific Northwest? I mean, typically it gets mm-hmm. pretty warm around this time. Not this year, so we'll uh, we'll do a little wow. barbecuing with some friends and um, you know just enjoy enjoy the time off and and uh, you know celebrating for the Fourth. Typical yep. barbecuing is on the agenda for me too. Uh, one of my uh, neighbors is on crutches, and so I think I'm going to try and bring the grill over to her, and we'll just we'll just we'll just do the neighborhood thing that we normally do next door to me. Nice. Do it over at her house. Nice. Yeah, it'll be fine. 
Um, cool. So before we jump into the topic that we want to talk about today, and it's going to be a little different than y'all probably expect, uh, because we're going to take a break on that December 31st, 1989 reading that we were working on. We were, we were talking about the magical personality for about half of that reading, and then it was going to go into the magical, the higher self was what we talked about, but then it kind of gets more focused on the magical personality, and that's what I thought we were going to talk about. That's what we recorded like half a podcast last time with me barely audible. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to let listeners know about a project that's going on right now. Um, a longtime LL research comrade and friend uh, by the name of uh, Pupak Hagigi, uh, who I believe lives in Iran right now, uh, has started a Patreon uh, to fundraise for creating a Farsi translation of the law of one. And uh, she reached out to me, honestly, like probably two or three months ago. And I told her I would publicize this and I, uh, I didn't do it in a timely fashion like I promised. So I'm sorry about that, Pupak, but um, I'm getting to it now. I think it's really, really cool that these translation projects are going on, but you may not realize, you know, there's there's translation teams for Chinese, uh, for Czech, um, German, French. I mean, a lot of these people are going to be meeting up at the LL Research Gathering in Prague, I believe in August, if I'm not mistaken. Go to llresearch.org, uh, check that out. But keep in mind that uh, although LL Research has more f uh, resources than they used to, they do not uh, financially support, to my knowledge, any of these projects. They are all labors of love. And of course, like, you know, people in different parts of the world have different, you know, needs and, and, and capacities. So when people ask for help for this stuff, I think it's really incumbent on us as the community to step up and make sure that they're uh, supported. So not to put any pressure on you, but you know, uh, a monthly contribution of even like $5, I think would be really useful uh, for folks who are doing this work uh, in places where, you know, like everybody, everybody should have the ability to uh, access and, 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 and see if this information is right for them. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So that, yeah. So the um the we'll post uh, a link to the Patreon in the show notes. But if you go to patreon.com, the official name is Law of One underscore Farsi. Law of One one spelled out underscore Farsi F A R S I. So just wanted to throw that out there. We don't get a chance to really uh promote other people's work very often. Uh. So, so please, please consider uh, supporting that. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. So we were going to talk about, we were going to finish the, the, the 1989 session, but we, but now we find ourselves in a situation of doing emergency broadcasts, emergency podcast. Emergency. Because, <laughs> That's <laughs> because, right. because Vice Magazine uh, published an article recently that focused on the raw material, the law of one, LL research, and in particular through the lens of the law of one Reddit. Now I know that there are at least a couple of people on the subreddit who listen to this. I'm not a big Reddit guy. Um, probably, probably would go ham if I was, so it's a good thing. I just got off Twitter and that was <laughs> painful. And uh, do you use Reddit a lot? Uh, Brian? No, but I've found it more helpful than Twitter in regards to not falling down, a falling into a black hole of despair. I don't have the algorithm driving anger and negativity to me. That doesn't mean that doesn't exist on various subreddits, but at least on Reddit, I'm able to focus and I can, I'm able to pick and choose what the, at least what subject matter is in front of me. I love seeing the same. Spoken like a guy who's never <laughs> spoken like a guy who's never discovered the "Am I the Asshole" subreddit. Because <laughs> oh my god, is that a rabbit hole? I'm always just astounded by human creativity. 
just the memery, the jokes, the the comedy, the people taking each other too seriously, people taking themselves too seriously. It's all it's all great entertainment. <laughs> but uh <clears throat> but since our conversation yesterday, I did peruse a little bit the uh the Law of One subreddit and I think I'm going to peruse it a little bit more. Um candidly, I think there's some good fodder on there for our conversations because there are a lot of new people to the material on the on that subreddit and i think there's some interesting kind of uh level one topics that you know we can cert- I, w- I would certainly love to talk about um because consistent stuff comes up and uh yeah. and um yeah i th- i think it'd be uh good stuff to talk about but um yeah yeah i agree uh but in particular right now we want to talk about this vice article the uh wheel and of course of course we'll have a link to it in the show notes Mm -hmm. uh the the name of it's on the motherboard section the sort of the tech section of vice why i guess because reddit's involved um but the name of the article is redditors revived an obscure cult that believes a mass harvesting of souls is eminent. That really offended me because we are not obscure. Okay. We are not obscure. <laughs> Thank you. Joke hit. Okay. The joke hit. That's my first joke. <laughs> that's my first joke. <laughs> oh man. That's good. That's good stuff, man. It's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know what you mean. Uh, well, well, when you sent this to me, because I could see the look in your eye, like you, you said, I'm not going to tell you what I think. I don't want to contaminate, you know, your opinion before you get into it. And I could see that. Like, I could see that look in your eye. I'm like, oh, it's one of those. And I read this headline and I laughed. I did an old I did an old LOL and because I'm like, oh, boy, this is uh, this. Huh? OK, let's see where this guy goes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, what a headline! What a I, what a clickbaity headline! Yeah, yeah. I mean, kind of what do you expect from the magazine that Gavin McInnes started, right? Like the Proud Boy guy. Hmm. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, like, I don't necessarily think it's that unfair of an article because the. That doesn't mean that I was. It didn't upset me. It did upset me. I mean, I wanted to punch a wall. I was so upset. But mostly, that's because, you know, I just, I just feel like, um, you know, personally, I'm just speaking for myself personally in my own, and this has my own distortions in it and all that. But I just feel like, you know, the LO Research Administration. It seems like they their message, if they were putting the message out that focuses on what's important about this it didn't get through so much mm. um and you but and you're that a, might have that is an, that? A, that is an assumption that yeah it is anything and right. everything right. they said see whenever i read anything whenever i read a quote because i've been i've been interviewed before um not because i was important just because the news crew was around doing a story and they're like hey there's a kid let's interview him and it I've been mis every time I've been interviewed, I have been not just misquoted, but stuff was made up, <laughs> right? Same here. And it's, so it's like I read this, and then I read to the point where they reached out to uh, Gary Austin, Jim, and I'm like, oh, oh, is that what they said? Okay, Tamlin, because everything else that you've written here is like is way out of context, and uh, yeah. it's like so. It's like I just don't believe. I read this as pure entertainment because. I just didn't believe a single thing. Well, I mean, I know a fair bit about it, so I don't have to choose to believe or not. But anything that tried to be factual in here, I'm like, oh, probably not. <laughs> because everything else is so skewed to be entertaining and and ex- extravagant, you know. Yeah, I, 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 I want to be clear. Like, I have my own feelings about how the LL Research Organization is run. So my suspicions are not solely stemming from the, how this article, uh, 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 the light that it shows them in, but also like, you know, 
when they say in a Zoom call in a lengthy back and forth email exchange. As somebody who's had a lengthy back and forth email exchange with somebody in that org, I can understand uh, that maybe the the that 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 might be an issue. I'll just leave it there. Oh, sure. But anyway, the the point of this is not to criti criticize LO Research. The point of this is to sort of use this article as a lens for. Uh, this philosophy of the law of one and confederation uh, philosophy to use it as a lens to talk about how we sort of think about that in the public sphere. I know this is something that uh, people who've come to homecomings or people I've talked to um, in, in, in one-on-ones or whatever, this is often a concern because it is very important to them. And yet they feel like there's no real way to talk about it to somebody that doesn't lead to a bunch of weirdo questions or just misunderstandings. And frankly, I have also had this problem in the past. And I feel like I, at least for myself, have a strategy. Like I, at least for myself, have figured out, to my satisfaction, A, ways to talk about it to somebody who doesn't know what this is and doesn't maybe has no interest in spirituality or religion or even philosophy, right? B, um, how to come from a place of authenticity about it that doesn't try to delude them and say that this isn't channeling, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, doesn't try to attribute to it more woo-woo than is necessary, right? And C, like, mm -hmm. and this is the bigger issue for us in the Other Selves Working Group, which is to articulate a theory of channeling so that this phenomenon can be understood on the terms that people approach it on. In other words, if you are a secular humanist, humanist who just thinks that all of this is made up, I have a way to talk to you. If you're a Catholic who thinks that this is a demon, I have a way to talk to you. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that I'm changing my story based on who I talk to. It means what I emphasize is about connecting with the person in the same way that if they were telling me about something that was important to them, they would do it in a way that would try to connect with me so mm. that I understand why it's valuable to them. Mm -hmm. It's not a design, it's not designed to convince them of anything. It's designed to show them my heart. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. But let's separate the issues here or the the people we would be conversing with on the one hand you have a person who is at minimum opening open to listening to you and to trying to understand a little bit about where you're coming from on the other hand you have the author of this article which their only intent was to use again extravagant words make this you know tell a story that it tell a story not tell the story but tell a story that is meant for a specific audience that that has very few uh, truths in it it's got some facts a lot of the you know things that that what, are written what do they say in there that's untrue well that i hmm, ooh, this is a whole other podcast but i think there are differences between truths and facts because facts are literal, they're literal truths. But if you tell a fact in a way that is way out of context and implies other meanings, you are not being truthful. So in here, he says, you know, he, uh, he there, there's one line in here where he's talking about the, uh, the tapes contain classic good versus evil story with extra intergalactic steps, the benev the benevolent confederation of planets on one side and the malevolent orion group on the other and he says figures from both even occasionally manifest here on our silly planet as quote-unquote wanderers like nikola tesla one of the good guys or genghis khan the evil orion group now there's a factual inaccuracy here which friends if you're reading the news and you spot one factual inaccuracy just assume they're everywhere so there's one here he says that genghis khan was a wanderer not true but, you know, um, the way that, uh, the way that this is, this is phrased, like Nikola Tesla, parens, one of the good guys, or Genghis Khan, parens, the evil Orion group. Okay, that's factually correct. 
but the context there, the the wording of there, it's like, okay, is there good versus evil? I don't think in the raw contact that that is that it's described that way. It's no, it's service to others, it's service to self, and there's there's a mess of context around that. But here, one example of telling of of speaking factually about the material, but the truth of the message is not woven in those factual statements. I so, more or less agree with so, you. So, so I, I guess going back to my original point, you have um, we can talk about how to communicate these ideas uh, to honest people, and then we can talk about how to communicate these ideas or how not to to journalists that have <laughs> a specific intent with their article, you know, or people in I, general who are just there to poke fun, you know. I, see, I don't make a distinction so as much as you do. First of all, I want to tell you that I am very sympathetic to this art, to this author. Um, it is not a journalist's job to digest our philosophy to the degree that they would be able to make these subtle distinctions. Look, when I first encountered polarity, it seemed a lot like good and evil. When I first encountered the idea mm -hmm. of the Orion Confederation and there being another kind of confederation and then being yeah. uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sort Bunch of like of dickheads. in conflict, I looked at it as if it was kind of an apocalyptic <laughs> totally. good versus evil. Like, like these are ways in which and, and like and we're just talking about his understanding. What about his readers? How would he ever in in in, in a in an article of this length really lay this stuff out? He does it's not his area of interest. He's the the thing is the, the the thing is is that he's reporting honestly on a Reddit on a subreddit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this is the kind of stuff that they talk about on that subreddit. Mm -hmm. Now now if we have an issue with that, it is on us to make our case for a different way that we can offer people to understand it. But it's not his job to do anything but report, and I honestly don't think there's a lot of like distortions. To the extent that they are dishonest. I think there are distortions to the extent that he put together a narrative that works for him and his editor mm -hmm. that allows them to sell advertising. That's his job. And yes. if we didn't get our message across, either through the official organization that claims to speak for the philosophy, or even us as a community on Reddit, on Bring Forth, on these other platforms, then that's on us. That's how I feel about it. Oh, and sure. You can see, you you can see why uh, I have a different like feeling about the role Ella Research played in this than you do, because that's how I feel. I don't think it's on journalists to understand what, at the end of the day, is a pretty bizarre philosophy. No, I think you're even, right. Even 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 on the non-transient stuff. And no, I think your point is accurate too. There's a lot. There's a lot more people who think about it the way you do than there are the way I that think about it the way I do. Mm. I'm only saying that uh, that one. Imagine, imagine Tamlin writing an article if he was back in uh, <clears throat> the Jerusalem area in the year zero, and he'd be like, "New cult is is coming about, you know. New cult arises from like the supposed New cult Messiah, <laughs> you know. You know, it's like, okay, y journalists come in with an intent. That is all. That's all I'm saying. There's an intent there, yeah. and once they've determined that intent. There's no, there's no budging the needle. Yeah, you know, and, and, that's and all. Let's be honest. A vice culture, tech culture yeah. journalist <laughs> is not going to be <laughs> yeah. like Tamlin. I'm sure you're. I'm sure you're a great. Uh, you you are a good writer, and like I'm sure you've done awesome work. But like you, you know that this is not. This is this is not the the epitome of of, of journalism and what's mm. possible. That mm. said, I I actually appreciate. I think he wrestled with the philosophy a lot more than most journalists would have. Mm. I just think it's hard. Like here's, the, here is the number one thing for me. Um, first of all, I'm embarrassed as crap that there are, that he talks about the events and merchandise that Ella research says for D as on a coffee cup. I think that's embarrassing as crap. I think that reflects poorly on all of us. Um, and I think he's right to point out, um, when, when things get commercial to see the commercial side. And the reason is, is not that I think that LL Research is doing anything really that bad, but that so many cults wrap up financial control and exploitation 
in their work. So it's important to keep track of that. And, to, and I think we should be more rigorous. I mean, it's one of the reasons uh, the working group doesn't raise any money. We fund it all ourselves. We don't want that uh, uh, clouding things up. So, mm -hmm. all right, let me get, the, now that that's off my chest. Oh man, where was I going? I just think that like there are a lot of weird details in this work that are not foundational to the philosophy. And I wish mm -hmm. that as uh, that, that those Bigfoot, even the UFO stuff sometimes could be more de-emphasized in how people talk about this philosophy because it isn't important. Nobody's life is changed by knowing that Bigfoot is some sort of Maldekian like like reincarnation, right? Like nobody, that's not going to affect how you live your life or how you polarize. It is vital that we do what the Confederation says and we take a critical eye to the work that comes through these channels. We are not a cult, but the reason we're not a cult is that a cult has an adoration for a charismatic philosophy or leader. And they think that there's one rule that everybody should live by and that that leader of philosophy has all the answers. I yes. reject that idea completely as a law of one adherent. I do not think that this, has, this philosophy has all the answers. The point is that we live in a gigantic mystery and yeah. that we need to be humble when we talk about our beliefs. We need to be humble about the limits of our knowledge, our ability to certify to other people what quote unquote truth is like the, the point, like I said before, the point is not to get all of these facts about the philosophy, right? But to communicate the essence of it in the, in the moment, in the, in the, in the unique nexus of other self and other self meeting in a position in time, in a position in space and for a moment, having an experience of unity, even if that's just through a pleasant conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's the, I, I really do think that like the more that we think in terms of this isn't about converting people, this isn't even about explaining ourselves. This is about connecting with people and anything that comes out about the philosophy that serves that is useful. And anything that comes out about the philosophy that detracts from that is not useful. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that idea? I... That was a lot, but I think, um, I mean, I think our thought, our, our thoughts and views are in alignment for a lot of that. Um, I mean, you bring up, you bring up just the notion of a cult. The other way you can define cult or describe cult, another term for it is called a high control group. And there's a whole, there is, there's a set of rules or, or, or typical typicalities, I guess if you want, if that's a word around what a cult is and like you said there's a unifying either um, philosophy that has all the answers or a charismatic leader and it is not just the leader that defines a cult it is the interaction of its members it is high control you are not allowed to have a diverging viewpoint you are not allowed to behave differently than the philosophy or the leader dictates that you behave. There's no allowance for any, there's no wiggle room there. And that, that the whole point, I think of the law of one is this, hey, you're on your own journey, figure it out, you know, do what you want. But here's this template, here's this map you can work off of, if you're trying to grow spiritually. But yeah, there's no, there's no leader. I think Ra, whether on accident or on purpose, shows that entity's complete fallibility by messing up <laughs> they're messing up humans in you know thousands of years ago by whatever it was they did oh but by trying to intervene a little bit more heavy-handed and and you know show the law of one and then people took it the wrong way it's like oh you think they're a super you think that they are like gods well they didn't see that one coming you know, they didn't they didn't really recognize human nature to the point where they're like, yeah, they'll they'll be fine with this tech and they'll be fine with this, you know. Nope. You know, so, yes, this is about it's um obscure. That is kind of the a correct word. But cold. This is one. This is pretty far away from that. So. Yeah, see, I, I honestly think that it's on us to show that we're not a cult by our behavior. And I have seen cult-like cult -like stuff happening in our community. Hmm. 
specifically around a certain organization. And like what I would say to people is like, you don't have to agree with me. But one thing that you can do to show for sure that we are not a cult, critique. Love and support is not without critique. It does not mean that we just, we can love people and we can also say, hey, I think, I think this need might need some uh, review. I think we might need to look at what's going on here. Um, and especially like, you know, if this was a democratic organization in which we all shared in its governance, that would be one thing, but it's not. It is unilaterally controlled. <laughs> I, I hate to say this. And I think that um, I think that reflects poorly on the philosophy, and I wish it were different. I don't have any control over that. I, I, I would like to see it change. But right now, the board is selected pretty much by the people that it's supposed to oversee. And uh, there is no there is no real voice for volunteers. Uh, so I would like to see that change. And then I think once we do that, we start having what Carla Rueckert used to call the democracy of the spirit, where we are all valued as seekers and our contributions and mirroring to each other don't are not just like something on the side of the governance of an organization that frankly claims to speak for this philosophy, right? Um, it instead is something that integrates that more spiritual family, as my friend Joseph D'Artes put it, that integrates the spiritual family with the legal family, right? With the legal organization. You know, LL Research is a nonprofit. Uh, we are a community uh, of people who try to support each other seeking. Those two things are different things, but they could be integrated in a way that makes them more hand in glove. Hmm. So sorry to come down on this organization that has done so much to change my life. I, I, I'm grateful for what I'm grateful for, and I would like to see change what I would like to see change. And those two things can exist side by side. Um, my heart goes out to the people at LO Research. I know they're doing their best. Um, but I also know that I would not be the man that I am if people in my life who loved me didn't tell me where they thought there were things that could be done differently. Mm. And, um, you know, this is a, this is an issue that we talked about a couple of episodes ago with Dartet, with Joseph D'Artes about criticism. Mm -hmm. What is the role that criticism plays in serving others in a service to others way? Um, that is a mystery, and I would be the first to say that I have often had criticisms that were not helpful, that probably came from a negative place, but uh, at the same time, that does not mean that all criticism is unwarranted, and, it, and I don't think it means criticism is, criticism is unwarranted here, especially when we live in an age of things like Nexium and Scientology, and there are really dark <laughs> things associated, I mean, Honestly, the, when I first encountered the raw material, the closest thing that it looked like was Heaven's Gate. Do you remember Heaven's Gate? Were you too young for that? I was too young. I've only read about it. <clears throat> it was right when I graduated high school, I think. I think it was 97. Oh, boy. I was a, not. A, I just was not watching the news when I was in seventh yeah, grade. It, <laughs> nor should you have been. <laughs> but... But I remember it was, and I remember thinking how bizarre it was, because I wasn't into the UFO thing. That wasn't the angle I came to this material from. But they believed in a harvesting of souls, mm. that a UFO, mm. that Halley's Comet, which was coming around at that time, was actually a UFO, and they committed mass suicide. It was like 30 mm. people mm -hmm. committed mass suicide um, in order to ascend and go to the next level of evolution and be picked up by this UFO. We have a duty, listeners, I believe. Let me let, consider what I'm saying. We have a duty to live and, and serve in a context where stuff like that happens. I mean, even in mainstream churches, there's abuse. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it is endemic in our society. And we have a duty to show love and light in a way that doesn't make people have to necessarily trust us all the time that our intentions are good i think that that's how i feel about that hmm. what if the joke's on us for the heaven's gate thing what if they did ascend wouldn't that be a, a kicker 
<laughs> what if see, what see, if there's it's always about perspective right? i know i'm like what if there's an okay so what if th- there is an afterlife once you die you go there and what if like there's heaven's gate people waiting for you like bro what took you so long we've been here since, <laughs> we've been here for 30 years already um anyway see that's how i would know that they are that they are a, a, a negative thought form designed to <laughs> distract me and confuse me because yeah. they would be experiencing time on a very different level than I would. So why would it have been taken long? See, I think I, I, I'm kidding. Of course, of course, I, I, I just, of I, course, I, I like, honestly, you're right in a way in that at a long enough time scale, we all go to the next level. We all return to the creator. So there is nothing at the end of the day from a cosmological point of view, risky or to be lost. Yeah. And I think it's always important to keep that in mind. Because I'm talking about something that I think is very serious and very, like, important for us to consider. Um, But at the end of the day, I don't want us to be so serious that we become dogmatic or doctrinal, right? Yeah. Like, people need to be able to be spontaneous. See, that's what's so – see, that's what's so, like, tough about what we're talking about is that on the one hand, you want to be authentic and you want to speak from the heart. On the other hand, you're you're walking that fine line of looking like a crazy. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Well, it's uh, that old joke. There's a subtle but important difference between peeing in the pool and peeing into the pool. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> context. You, If you have to know who you're talking to, what, you know, how crazy you can get in your conversation. Like if you're talking with somebody, there's a difference between showing them love and um, and – exemplifying that i love that you're still laughing <laughs> i mean the water's yellow no matter what you do man. <laughs> but that is hilarious um there's there's a difference between there's a there's there's a difference between living a life and explaining what led you to live the life that you're living and your journey is going to be your own. And if you're talking about UFOs and sixth dimensity beings on a different plane of existence versus the meat and potatoes of it, which is like, you know, I love loving others or I, you know, this makes me happy or, you know, whatever it is, there's a, there's a difference. <laughs> and we have to, you've got to zero in when you're having conversations, what the level of conversation is, a, how Blu-ray are you going to get? with that communication yeah. right you are you because yes. you can overdo it and you, or you can just keep it calm and, and lead by example but i want to go back for a second because i'm a bit obsessed with the notion that saying that we don't see the world the way it is we see it the way we are whenever i'm running into an issue with with someone or something, work, life, kids, whatever it is. I have that initial, you know, reaction, that human reaction. And then when I when I cool down or I start to work through it, I'm reminded that, okay, well, what does this say about what does this say about me? And not just me, my personality, but like what is it that I'm trying to do or trying to go for? <clears throat> um Oh boy, now I'm having a hard time remembering how this ties in to everything. Um, oh, just uh, uh, speaking of uh, um, the law of one and philosophy, speaking with other people, perhaps perhaps a relationship with the LL Research Organization. It's when you constantly, when you run into conflict, I'm just always reminded. I'm always thinking about, okay, well, what does this say? What does this say about me? Because I think when you were talking about um, critiquing, it took me back to my old teaching days. I used to be a drum a drum instructor. And it's like, how do you teach someone to come to the conclusions you've come to with in this re- in this regard with music, you know, with moving your hands and, and playing the drums? It's it is really challenging to try to guide someone into your worldview, you know, into your, into your lessons. It's a very fun experience, but 
if you have a goal in mind for how you want to see someone's behavior change, and in my scenario, it's very mundane. It is how do you move your hands and play paradiddles. Um, but how do you how do you instigate that behavioral change in someone? How do you help them come to the realizations that you have come to? But that that applies to everything to your relationship, my relationship with my wife. Like, how do I make her understand how I'm feeling? So she, she might not change, but at least she'll understand the way that I see the world. And then how can I continue to evolve myself so that I become less and less bothered by, or less and less mm, affected isn't the word. I need to sort this one out. But how do I continue to evolve so that I become more whole as an individual? more complete as an individual, such that when I read articles like this, like I can laugh at it rather than take offense. I would imagine some people read this and just were pretty up in arms. Well, they're calling me stupid because it's got that tone. And you're right. He brings up some stuff that is true, that is factual and true in the material. And it sounds crazy. So I can understand how this might upset people. But, but at the same time, how do we, how do we continually grow and, uh, yeah, become more whole and complete, um, such that this kind of stuff doesn't bother us. Or if we want to help old Tamlin really figure it out, how do we communicate with him? Um, you know, what it is and who we are. Well, it's funny you say that because I've actually thought about reaching out to him. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> And maybe he'll listen to this podcast and see another perspective maybe. on this. But um, in general, one of the things – this is funny because I actually just responded to somebody on the subreddit about this topic. Um, or maybe it wasn't the subreddit. Maybe it was a Facebook Law of One group. I, I can't remember. In any case, the first step is to recognize – it's it's almost stoic, right? Like. You don't have control over other mm. people. You can't control how they behave. Trying to get them to behave in a certain way is manipulative, not by law of one standards, by any standards. And, you know, uh, it's funny. The, the way that I think about this was actually influenced by, um, by, my, by my job um, or, my indus or the industry that I'm in, where I've done a lot of consulting in organizations. As a, as a software developer, you know, you, most organizations that are large have craziness going on when it comes to building software, right? And they often bring in uh, mercenaries like me uh, to parachute in, take stock of the situation, and respond and help them out. And so you find yourself in these dysfunctional organizations a lot of the time. Uh, where they're doing things in a way that is clearly unproductive. I mean, like, and that's always easy to see from the outside, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't mean to call them, like, dumb. Like, it's just, it's hard. It's a, it's, it's a big task of coordination. Um, and I read this book called Flawless Consulting by Peter Block. And he said, you know, basically, he tries to define a consultant as anybody who has expertise to address a situation or a problem but no power to do so, right? So from his point of view, even a lot of employees are internal mm -hmm. consultants because if they don't have the ability to execute on exactly what they think is right, uh, they're basically a consultant. Like they have to do what they're told. They have to work within the confines of the situation in which they find themselves. They can't change those confines. And so he says, if you're in a situation where you have no ability to control how thing, how the, the, the situation, the, 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 the confines, then your only way to do your job is to build, is to, is to build trust so that your influence will guide mm -hmm. them. Now that is right in line with the law yes. of one, right? Yes. It, it, it is, it is the idea that it is in that connection, in that deeper connection with people that something comes through. This is, this is, this is getting into that Hatan 83 session where they talk about communication mm -hmm. and words as a carrier wave of love. But like if you focus on the love, then the words will work themselves out, I find. Because that's what people are really responding to. The words are kind of just the proximate like container. But the love is what makes them 
have a change of heart. And, and they either respond to it or they don't, right? Like mm-hmm. people can reject love too. Like that actually absolutely happens. But you're much more likely to um, – you see, you have to think uh, – in my opinion, it's less about thinking how do I get my way and more how does we make this situation the most positive reflection of the creator possible. And that's a very different outcome than me just getting things the way that I mm-hmm. like it. I mean the world ain't Burger King. It's not going to always be your way, mm-hmm. you know? So you need – that is why acceptance is such an integral part of this philosophy. Acceptance of self, first of all. First and foremost, acceptance of self. But then acceptance of others. In this illuser – in this illusion where there seems to be a distinction. Mm -hmm. In reality, there is no distinction between self Mm -hmm. and others. There's no distinction between environment and subject, right? Like it's all one material. It's all one thing. And so we use thought and love and emotion – to play this, to, to, to dance this dance in which we try to synchronize with the way that, uh, and harmonize with the way that reality actually is in spite of way, the way the illusion appears to us. And if we can do that, then we can be there for other people in those meaningful, deep ways hmm. that help them. There's a difference between the words and the message and the words yep. that you speak if fueled by anger then the message is about anger. But if you're using the same words, but you're coming from a place of love, then the message is more about, hey, I care, or I'm concerned, or I'm struggling, help me. You know, the, the message is very different, ev- even though the words can be the same. I mean, you, you talk about this like, a, like in a work context. And um, if you're a manager and you're talking to one of your, one of your reports, are you just angry at your report all the time because they're doing a terrible job and you just you don't trust them but then but you know deep down you're not putting in the work you need to to make sure that they can do their job well the words you speak the uh, annual review you have with your report if you're coming from a place of insecurity and anger is very different than if you have just complete care and compassion for that person that's working with you. You know, you can say the same thing. Hey, you are not succeeding at your job. And that person will hear those words, but the message they get will be different. Because they can feel if they, they can feel if you don't like them or or if you love them. Yeah. Um absolutely. There's an old there's an old uh, <clears throat> business case study, I think in like management classes where the story goes that a, a company had just had a bunch of problems. They couldn't articulate what the problems were, so they hired a consulting firm. And after two weeks, the consulting firm came back and they had a list of five things that the company needed to address. And management was like, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, can you help help us figure out how you did this so that we can address this in the future? And the consultant said, yeah, we just we, uh, we interviewed all of your employees and asked for their top five problems that they needed <laughs> that needed to be worked on. So we, we wrote we, it down. Yeah, we, wrote, <laughs> we believed, we believed the people that you've yeah. hired, you know? So, yeah, but any, anyway, now we're, now we're off the, uh, now we're off the, this, uh, vice hit piece. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I think it's good because like, I believe Tamlin. I believe that this is what he thinks is an accurate representation. I genuinely believe that, like, he's reporting on what he thinks the the, the facts oh. are. Like, I really like like to me, this is a mirror, right? It is a mirror. One yeah. way to say is that, oh, you use the funhouse mirror, you use the distorted mirror. You should have used a mirror that was flat. The other way is to say this too is us, yeah. right? I I think that's perfect. This is a mirror. I, I would say not on. Uh, not on the philosophy per se or the material per se, but on how we react to someone else's opinion. And again, I, I usually assume good yeah. intent in others. I just, mm-hmm. I don't, I just have a thing with journalists. I just don't think they're truthful oh, yeah. a lot of the time. So I'm having a hard time assuming good intent. I simply think that this article had a, had a purpose. It, it had an intent that was not, the intent was not to understand. And I love this. When you're struggling, if you're angry, seek yeah. first to understand. Um, 
I don't think there's anything about understanding in this article. I think it's supposed to be entertaining. But how, how one reacts to this article, I think, yes, this provides a wonderful mirror for uh, introspection. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to punch a wall when I read the article. Don't do but that. You got to read drywall. Yeah, buddy. I did do that. Yeah. I, I need these. I need <laughs> these type. for That's my right. band. <laughs> but, uh, and my job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Jo- I have a job. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> your career, Jeremy. You need it for your career. <laughs> this is my career. And I have a side job where I make yeah. you know, software. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, um, like, and, and like, let me be clear, like I, we have different, we have different emotional responses and different intellectual responses to this. Um, I, I don't have the same view of journalists as you do. I can understand why you're coming from, but it's not my, it's not my view. Like to me, it's like, like I want to reiterate, it's on us to message. It's not on the rest of the world to understand us. It's on us to be understood. That is what a that is what somebody who advocates for a position does. Mm-hmm. And like, if people want to distort us, hey, he's not going to be the first, and he certainly isn't going to be the last. As this philosophy grows in exposure and influence, it will be critiqued more and more. And frankly, it should yeah. be. There are a lot, there are people out there who use the raw material and the Confederation philosophy. To run things that I would consider cults, oh, absolutely. That, I can I can name I can name three well, off the top of my head. I oh, won't okay. because <laughs> I've 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 gotten messy enough already. But if you if you have if you know about the larger milieu and when in which this philosophy operates, you probably know who I'm talking about. One of them just had a Hulu documentary come out about them. About them. So, what? Her. her. <laughs> okay. I I don't know many. The only I. The only person I know, I'm going to name names because I don't have the, I don't have strong opinions about this. Um, I only know of David Wilcock and I have not, I'm not familiar with much of David Wilcock's material. So I can't really speak. I can't really speak to the material. I only know that uh, from what I have seen that the material is brought up. At least he has an understanding of the material. I don't know if it's used to uh, enhance a, uh, he, he, you'd call it a cult-like leadership following for uh, Mr. Wilcock. Um, I do know I, I enjoy his content. You know, I enjoy the content, but uh, I mean, I do take everything with a grain of salt. But he's the only guy, he's the only guy that I know that even references the material in any productions or any stuff that he does. Um uh, there's a dude. I, I I hesitate to name names because I don't want to send people down oh, negative. Okay, holes, then don't. But, I guess it's uh, something. There's I a guy can... named ben, I... Bentinho Massaro. Hmm. Okay. Who read about? There was a Vice article about him a few years ago. Hmm. Read okay. it. See how this is being used. He claims to be like a seventh or eighth density entity or something like that. While he's smoking cigars that's a red, and harassing That's a women. red flag. I think if anyone claims to uh, be anything. Teal Swan is the one that had the Hulu documentary about her. Hmm. I think it's called The Deep End. Okay. And people have committed suicide because of her counseling. Oof. Um, She counsels people who are committing, who are talking about suicide. Mm-hmm. And frankly, that I don't even necessarily disagree with some of the things she says about how to approach mm-hmm. it. I just think that the responsible thing, if you have, if you think you have a novel and new way to deal with people who have suicidal tendencies, go get a doc, a, a MD, mm. go get, go study psychology, go come up with a theory that not just you can rent seek and charge rent mm. to access your, your, your technique. But go make it available to everybody. Do you see what I'm talking yeah. about? The way that 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 this people squat on this philosophy and then say I control whether or see, not you get you get the yes, or not. and that that is definitive of a cult or of a high control group or at least a, a leader who is trying to build such an organization. <laughs> if those are true, I I don't know about these individuals. I haven't looked into it, but yeah, if that's true, that yeah. That, just should take be. My word for it. <laughs> should I believe Just everything take, you say? You, you know my opinions. Just adopt them. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, I, I think David Wilcock is up there too. I hmm. mean, he's somebody that I used to call a mm-hmm. friend. 
Um, and he's brought a lot of people to the law of one, and I think he's much less harmful than the two other people mm-hmm. I spoke of. But still, I know it's I know this st- dude. Dude is rich, just the same way that Congress people keep getting richer and mm-hmm. richer as they stay in power. Dude keeps getting richer and richer as he makes YouTube videos that talk about QAnon and anti-vax stuff. Like, hmm. look, there that people can hold whatever opinions they want, but why do they have to get this pure philosophy muddled up in it? I thank God that uh, Tamlin, uh, this author of the article, didn't pull on the QAnon thread. Because there's tons of people who uh, talk about the law of one in the context of QAnon. Mm, that's a new one to me. There's tons that's of them. a new one to me. Interesting. It's <laughs> just that QAnon isn't front and center anymore because Trump has kind of receded yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Huh. So we need to be, we, when, we're, when we're engaging with other seekers about this philosophy, how we go about it, what we emphasize. Remember, I talk about this all the time. Ross says it is not the specificity of the information that makes it negative. It is the emphasis placed on it. What we should do, I believe, and what I try to do is place the emphasis on where I think it should be. I place the emphasis on where I think the helpfulness is, where the love is, where the insight is. I don't place the emphasis on a secret space program or blue avians mm. or like all of this other stuff. Like it, it beca- not because I don't believe it, whether I believe it or not, doesn't matter any more than it, whether it matters, whether it, whether mm. I believe in transubstantiation when I take communion. You know, right? this, this uh, thank you for bringing that up. Because this reminds me of if if you're a Christian, but you're focusing on how can I turn water to wine? Like, I love wine. How can I do this? It's <laughs> like if that's your focus, oh, I want to rock on water. I can go to Hawaii. Just, you know, whatever. I could just run to Hawaii or whatever. Um, if you are focusing on that rather than the love, you know, rather than the principle of the message you get focused on all that shiny stuff you know i mean who doesn't we i love fantasy and science fiction i i love talking about ufos and <clears throat> secret space program and you know tall whites and alien race i mean it's pretty i just finished small tangent i just finished the book um a new world by whitley streber and if you're unfamiliar with streber he wrote that banger of a book communion back in the 80s about his yeah, alien abduction. Absolutely. And he's written his journey has gone from um, aliens to more spiritual. His journey kind of mimics my own. Not that I've been abducted or claim to have been abducted, but it all started with aliens. <laughs> this whole process for me started with a science fiction book uh, by Tom DeLong. Um, and now I'm on the spiritual path. Funny. It feels like Whitley Strieber's, Strieber's the same way. And, um, it's a it's a it's a fun book to read, you know. He's he's got the aliens on one hand, and he's got trying to connect with his recently passed away wife on the other, and he brings up these wonderful like wonderful quips that like she used to say, she's used to say enlightenment is what's left when there's nothing or is what's left when there's nothing nothing inside us but love. I think that's the quote. You know, so it's this wonderful mishmash, kind of like the raw material. It's this wonderful mishmash of aliens and spirituality. You know, it's super fun. So, yeah, I mean, I get caught up in that. But but I, too. That's really cool. It is cool. (laughs) Because um, that that was also that was also the combination that was involved in that movie Arrival. Ah, Remember the, the language person was trying to communicate with these aliens, but she was also dealing with the death of her daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was all entwined because at the end of the day, it's all feeling and emotion and all of these things run together. Like what is more alien and mysterious than what's inside ourselves? Like well, right? it's funny you bring like, that up because in – I'm going to just plug this book. You should check it out. It's called A New World yeah, by yeah. Whitley Strieber. It's a reference to that old Philip Corso um, saying that uh, – Corso back in the 40s was basically on duty at like some radar station and and some aliens came in the room and they're like bro we need you to shut down this radar array or whatever 
And he said, well, what's in it for me? And they said, a new world, if you can take it. So it's a reference to that old Philip Corso cool alien stuff. But this entire book is littered with with spirituality. And in this book, he describes he describes his experience with, he calls them visitors, and just their mental abilities and how they are able to shine a light on the dark spots of him that either he didn't know were there or he did know, but they are very repressed. And it's just like the light's on and it's really uncomfortable. It causes, fe- whatever it causes, but um, it highlights that unknown that that part of the journey is exploring those and accepting those parts within you you know so who knows maybe it is aliens that's going to teach us the spiritual path (laughs) the spiritual path yeah yeah maybe i don't know um all i know is that whatever they teach us they're showing us something inside ourselves like you said yeah they're not it's not really something that's alien at the end of the day at all but Um, it feels that way it it's, it, it feels that way, but but we have that feeling all the time, honestly. And like getting comfortable with things that don't appear to be us seems to be the spiritual path writ large, right? Hmm. Hmm. That's good. Uh, one thing that I want, I, we've been going for about an hour or so, yeah. I think. Uh, I, I do want to touch on channeling in particular. Okay. When we talk about uh, the public eye on this philosophy, because I do think that that is a that is something that people can connect with. So, like, they may not understand the particular philosophy. They may not understand um, like how we really prosecute in our lives, um, but they do know what they often do know what channeling is. And there's lots of channels out there that seem like frauds. So it's an easy thing. Yeah. To point to and be like, aha, that's how I know y'all are, y- y'all are full of BS. And that's fine. People are totally allowed to think that we are full of BS. I, I have to accept that. That is part of this philosophy is respect for free will. They are allowed yeah. to believe that. However, what I would like to do is I would like to be able to express what I think about it in a way that they can at least understand not maybe not understand but wrestle with right in other words how can we use a rejection and a mockery to plant a seed even when we're hurting Mm. or we feel embarrassed or marginalized that's really interesting to me because it's something that i've played with a lot um i can and all i can do is i can give an example of how i've approached it and i would love to hear how you've approached it in your experiences uh so This is part and parcel of what we're trying to do in the working group is articulate a more unified theory of what channeling is, the the context in which it operates, and therefore like different like perspectives you can take on it that are all in some way true, but they're all limited, right? Mm. They're each is limited. Remember, I've talked about this idea that like truth is really this kind of like three dimensional thing but we only see it from sort of a two-dimensional perspective at any given time. So we can shift our perspective and then it looks different, although it's the same thing. Different theories, different descriptions will describe the same thing, even if they themselves seem to conflict or not be in line. So mm-hmm. with somebody who is secular, I would just be like, hey, we're just, we're, we are getting, we're doing meditation, getting in touch with our deeper selves and seeing if we can speak something that's useful. That doesn't. That's like automatic writing. I mean, that these are write, writers do exercises like this all mm-hmm. the time. We all know, musicians. I do this all the time when I'm playing music. You know, try to get to a different mindset and then see if something different than what I usually recognize as myself comes out. Um, moreover, uh, you know, the psychology bears out what the Buddhists have always said, which is that the self and identity and the personality are really arbitrary. If you look at your personality and sense of self now and then go back 20 years or 40 years and look at who you thought you were then, it would be very clear to see that what you are holding as common between those two senses of self 
is really just the body and the name at the end of the mm. day. Everything else is subject to change and transformation to the point where how can you say that they really are the same person other than they occupy the same body? Um, so I try to approach it that way. For people who ha maybe have more of a religious background, I, I try to uh, talk about how much of the Bible is channeled. Mm -hmm. What is a prophet back in, the, in biblical times but a channel yeah. of God? They just channeled Jehovah or Yahweh or something like that instead of the entities that we channel. And then what you're trying to do is you're trying to find some way for a person to seat what you're saying in their worldview. You're meeting them where they're mm. at. You're not asking for them to come to you. You're meeting them where they're at. And you are giving them a way to reconcile something that otherwise is just easy to chuck in the trash, just like they want to truck, chuck you in the trash, maybe. Now, they can still do that, but you're giving them an option. If it's somebody who uh, already has a, con a, a background in New Age, then I like to talk about... Um, the real philosophy, the concepts of free will, the concepts of distortion and polarity, and see how I can align that with things that they already feel and contrast it also with things they feel. Because it's important for us to say where we be open about. We are not trying to persuade anybody. Yes. I think that's a very important thing for me to point out because it sounds like I'm Never trying persuade. to – Persuade. Never them. persuade. No, 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 no. It's like, it's no, like no, no, going no. to a bar tr and it, trying to hit on a woman. Yeah. You're setting yourself up for failure. What you need to do is you need to just make a new friend, make a new introduction. Yeah. Take the pressure off. Exactly. You're never going to persuade yeah. someone. They have to – they will persuade them, themselves if you plant the seeds and deep enough. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> I, I like how – no, no, no. I know this that we have always wanted to, 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 to take this podcast in the pickup artist direction, <laughs> and now we've gotten there. Finally. Ah, I've been waiting Fantastic. for that. All right. We can wrap it up. <laughs> it's, now you can go on Joe Rogan, man. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I kid. I kid. I kid. Um, I – I, yeah, I like I, does that I think I actually think that took a lot less time than I thought well, it I love um the idea of coming to where someone else is. And I have yeah. if, if I ever have a spiritual conversation, it is probably going to be with a Christian. And I love trying to take it to where they are, but also just provide some of my perspective or my frustrations. You know, um, for example, a consistent one that I'll bring up, and by consistent, I mean like three or four times have I brought this up with different <laughs> different friends in the last year, is just the notion of Christianity focusing on Jesus's death rather than his life, and the mm -hmm. the kind of guilty association that uh, the lay person or the secular person sees with the concept of sin, and. And I like to throw out, hey, instead of Jesus dying for our sins and for all of us being bad people, so to speak, you know, um, maybe take it from a, give it an Eastern context, an Eastern view that uh, the idea yeah. of karma and unbalanced relationships and that you got to go through this reincarnation cycle to find that balance. Well, from maybe from an Eastern lens, Jesus came in and lived that exemplary life. And then forgave. He forgave those who tortured him and killed him. And by forgiving, he cleared that karmic slate so that everyone could start fresh. You know? And I and I like to bring that up. It's like it's a different view on the same event that carries a slightly different context. You know? But but it's a it's always a good conversation. You know, I've never gotten pushback on that idea. It's like, oh, I didn't I never thought of that. Or Oh, that's interesting. What an interesting idea. You know, I'm not, but I'm not trying to tell them, oh my gosh, boy, Christianity is wrong with this notion of sin and that everyone's guilty and you have to accept Jesus as the Messiah. You know, I'm not trying to persuade them that the way that they feel or believe yeah. is incorrect. Only just provide a little, a little thought that like, well, hey, have you thought of it this way? But I love having those conversations yeah. of, like you said, trying to meet someone where they're at and just plant a seed because if you plant a seed and then you live by example it's really funny how that seed can grow 
Yeah. I, I would also say that if you are going to meet somebody where they're at and not have them come to you, one thing that's incumbent on you is, well, then you have to know yourself really well in order to be able to exit the context mm. in which that self is defined, mm -hmm. right? And go into somebody's alien context. You have to really know yourself inside and out to do that well. And so that is something that depends not on you doing the right thing in the moment with that individual. That depends on the work you do all up to that point. Mm -hmm. Daily meditation, reflection, balancing your distortions, being honest with yourself about how you're treating the other people and what's going on in your life and how you're treating yourself and, 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 and the negative and positive thoughts that you uh, occupy your mind with. Like all of these things contribute to your readiness to be there for other people. If we want to serve, one implication of the Confederation's philosophy is that most of the work of that service is beingness, yes. not doing things. I love it. And therefore, we need to be ready. We need to prepare ourselves through the discipline of the personality, knowing ourselves, accepting ourselves, and becoming the creator, doing all of this work on ourselves ahead of time so that when we're in the moment, we can, do, we can open to spirit and do the thing that needs to be done that we can't possibly fathom its usefulness. The the iceberg of spiritual work is that self work you know it's like the the tip of the iceberg is your interaction with others and planting the seeds and maybe sharing your views so much of the work so much of the path is is within yourself you know now yeah. yep anyway <clears throat> So in that, so when you when you think about it that way, kind of doesn't matter what people write about us, yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's just another way for us. It's just another pretext to relate to another part of the Creator, and um, to try to be there for them. How can we be there for this? That's and that's the thing. That's kind of like brings me full circle because it's like I would like for us as a community to be there for even journalists who want to show their readers what we're about, and it's on us to do that. That's yeah. kind of what I mean. Is that it's, it's not just that we're responsible. It's that there's work to be done to be ambassadors of the creator in this situation and in other situations. It's possible. It is completely possible. And it's just a matter of what, listener, what do you want? What do you desire? Because that desire, that as you purify it, will propel you through your evolution. And situations like this where people write stuff about us is just one chapter in a very, very, very long book. Mm -hmm. And we'll always get another chance. I guarantee you we will have another opportunity as a community to engage this kind yeah. of thing. A good session, Jeremy. Is that, <laughs> does that wrap it up? I yeah. think so. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's weird to, it's weird to have a uh, – we've done so many uh, episodes about channeling sessions. It's weird to do a session about an article. <laughs> yes. Well, this just this uh, was a good catalyst. A, yeah. Good, good I catalyst agree. for discussion at minimum. But um, yes, I think you put it very well. This piece is a mirror. So, and look in the mirror and be honest with what you see. <clears throat> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, then let's go ahead and end this. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast just by listening to us. We always love to hear uh, from listeners. If you have questions, if you have ideas for things you'd like to hear us discuss, this is a conversation. I do not want to just preach that to would be you a cult. guys. <laughs> yeah, that would be a cult, right? Like I want this to be an engagement. Um, there's a lot of places that we can take this podcast. So Make your voice known. Like, let us know, like, what's resonating and what's not hitting the mark. Uh, we always want to know that. Don't forget to look into the Law of One in Farsi translation uh, Patreon. Anything else you want to add, Ryan? No, just thanks for another wonderful morning conversation. It's so good to catch up after so long. Yeah. Well, listeners, as always, have a great week. Or